Four. So good evening, everybody. We are going to get started. I'm Erin Brunel, as you know, uh, Vice Chair of the School Building Committee, and it is Tuesday, May 30th at 6.04 p.m. Hola, vamos a comenzar con todo. Oh, please mute, your, please mute yourself. Um, so yeah, welcome, everybody. We're going to go ahead and get started. Just a reminder that this uh, meeting is being audio and video recorded. And uh, so we moved the agenda around just a little bit. It's going to be a rather quick meeting, mostly just a few updates. Uh, but we need to approve our minutes from our last meeting so that way we can submit those to the MSBA. So uh, Margaret and I chat today. We went ahead and moved that to the first um, agenda item. Oh, I'm sorry. Before I get started, just confirming there is no public comment. Correct, Miss Linville? I didn't receive any either. Thank you so much. Sorry, guys. <laughs> so now moving forward, um, I will entertain a motion to approve the minutes of our previous meeting, which I'm sorry, oh. I don't have them in front of me, so I don't have the date. So we'll It's uh, April 25th. April 20 what? I'm sorry? 25th. April 25th. Okay. Uh, so uh, on no, the I'm motion gonna, to approve the minutes from the, Does the anybody meeting to see April them? 25th. I heard Whitney Anderson with the motion, and I believe I heard Mark Lubold with the second. Sounds Any good. Any further discussion on the motion, folks? Seeing none, could all those in favor please raise your digital hand or your physical hand and hold them up for Miss Linville to get a count? Again, this is all those in favor of the motion to approve the minutes. If for some reason your screen's not on, please feel free to unmute and say aye. Seven, eight. Now I only have eight, eight. Oh, wait. Nine, 10, 11. Okay, hold on. Let me just take a quick picture of the screen. It's really Ksenia who should be, will be doing this. She's taking over notes. I don't know if she's here though. Okay. Petros, Petros is doing notes tonight. Okay. And I'm not sure if Peter can raise his virtual hand because he's driving. We or didn't need him to. I had enough okay. without him. Yeah. Okay, great. All right, thank you, folks. Um, I'm gonna turn it over to Margaret and she's gonna run over a few updates. Um, as I'm sure most of you have reviewed your agenda, we will be taking another vote on, uh, just like to formalize the update with the Hoyle Gas and Electric. So uh, Margaret, I don't know if you wanna start there or if you wanna start yeah. the schedule review. I, just because the, I think the, the Holyoke gas proposal really needs uh, a vote. It's a change yep. from what was submitted in schematic design. And I, I want to also give credit to Whitney, who's really spearheaded this discussion with Holyoke Gas and Electric. I did send you all earlier today in your email the document. Um, I can pull it up, but I think maybe before I do that, Whitney, can you give us an overview of um, how, where you got to with Holyoke Gas and Electric and um, tell us, fill the committee in about um, this, un, this interruptible supply of gas um, that's documented in the attachment? Sure. Uh, and I apologize. I thought I had sent it about a week and a half or so ago, but unfortunately got stuck in a draft. So uh, I saw that David Yost had reached out and wanted some uh, further uh, documentation in that regard. I apologize. I thought I had previously sent it. But the, what we have now before us um, that we had inherited from the previous design from Jones Whitsett was a, uh, a, a heat pump air to air VRF, variable refrigerant flow system, which uh, had, you know, unique as it is, they have been incorporated into entire buildings, but the technology is relatively recent for that regard. And what happens in, in, in the very short realm of the uh, technicalities involved is the equipment does not have an extremely long uh, longevity, uh, somewhere between 12 to 15 years for the primary components. The, there is quite a bit of uh, infrastructure um, as far as piping and refrigerant flow that takes place throughout the entire structure in order to utilize the method of uh, delivery and distribution. And it's uh, quite expensive in comparison to a traditional natural gas supply of which every other one of our schools in the district, aside from Peck and Donahue, 
is it utilizes. So um, a further review in regards to the g and offering, um, and as from their website, um, did list for commercial customers of which we are one potential, a opportunity for utilization of natural gas on an interruptible basis. The districts had previously utilized this at Kelly School, oh, 15 years ago, uh, in, a, in an area of the city where shortages were quite common down in the flats. And what we did was we had a dual fuel burner. The primary fuel was natural gas. The secondary fuel was oil, heating oil, that many of you might have in your own homes, perhaps. But with that in mind, the benefits of that type of a system, number one, you can utilize the natural gas which in this instance satisfies the prerequisites of design for the model school of which we have uh, inherited some good effort from Mount Vernon Group in relationship to the utilization of that for the previous iterations of this particular project. And then from there, uh, preliminary conversations with the gas uh, and electric Gas Division Superintendent Brian Roy, uh, one over the phone and two with all the various parties for uh, Chris LeBlanc and, and the heating engineer for this particular project. And we were able to determine and uh, through the back and forth in regards to some of the technical usages that were currently existing for natural gas at the PEC site, was, which is known as the connected demand and the anticipated demand of the new design of the g &E was able to offer us this opportunity to engage in the uh, interruptible service opportunity that they present. So with that in mind, there still are some technicalities to be worked out in relationship to some of the other aspects of utilization of on-site generation through photovoltaics and perhaps storage with at the current time the opportunities for lithium batteries which the city currently enjoys in various photovoltaic installations throughout the city and i know that's a little bit tricky to understand what that means but it's a unique matrix of, of potential savings and and the generation of electricity on site that could be blended into specifically directly usable at 1916 Northampton Street, the Peck School site, would be a 100% benefit to the city and almost be an annuity as long as the sun shines, shines in relationship to deferred costs. So as well as a natural gas, we also could have the potential of, uh, of uh, very accelerated return in relationship towards utilizing on-site generated electricity to augment the other forms of energy required for domestic water um, in the kitchens as well as the bathrooms and a variety of other concerns uh, lighting and the general usage of electricity within the structure so that's kind of the background and uh, it's, it's very very accommodating with the city to allow us to uh, do that very straightforward and very responsive in relationship to the gas department's uh, rendering immediately after we had the meeting to put forth a notification. And then now we run through the challenges of trying to actually make that work using Frank's uh, subcontractors for the various sub trades. And then a further discussion, which is not on the table tonight for vote, but which will be to m utilize to its maximum potential the opportunity for the site to generate electricity and then possibly also combine that, as I mentioned earlier, with storage on site. So that's it in a nutshell. Does anyone have any questions? I see Mr. Yost's hand. Go ahead, David. Yeah. Yes. Uh, thank you, Whitney, for uh, for uh, you know doing all the uh, on the research for that. I didn't realize until uh, the other day that you were. But um, 
I don't know if you got into it at all, but uh, would we be obligated to have propane as a backup fuel or would be able, would be able to, uh, or if anybody would know, if we'd be able to have electric as a backup, you know, for, uh, the, for the, uh, the days that we might potentially be, have, have the gas service interrupted? Oh, I can I can take a whack at that. So we do have some opportunities there, David. Um, number one, we also have, uh, so currently what we will have on site will be a backup electrical generator. And that traditionally, what we have found best in our recent uh, installations, we've had two installations of electric generators. Diesel power works very conveniently for that. The And that's a separate entity unto itself. The other opportunities for uh, the interruptible fuel source could be electricity. Um, in this instance, because we have an existing heating system that will primarily utilize natural gas, it would be one that we would hope to augment that existing equipment with either a dual fuel burner those operate with a, a burner assembly that injects fire into a water vessel, which heats the water that then distributes around the structure. So that's easily utilized with oil, or that's also uh, relatively easily utilized with propane as well. And the days of augmentation that you can see, or the actual interruption is highlighted in that communication from Brian Roy and the gas electric. And I think last year there were two days. So out of the entire heating season, um, it, it has been minimal. There are other opportunities or instances historically where there have been more days, but that's dependent upon the severity of the weather. And it's really, really cold weather that causes us to have that happen. Coincidentally, at the same time, the G&E is augmenting their stored capability of natural gas at the Mueller Road site in West Hoyoke, which gives them a greater capacity to avoid that interruption. And uh, it all plays into the matrix. But the, the instances of the, the opportunity for the alternate fuel would be electricity. Most preferable would be uh, either oil or propane. And for alternate uses, also diesel in regards to the electrical emergency. Does that answer kind of give you some ideas about where that might be going? Yeah, thank, uh, yeah, and I was thinking if you're going to have the uh, the diesel generator on site anyway, then you could use that as an as an alternate fuel. And uh, in longer term, though, you know, I'm thinking if we had a system that, you know, it would be natural gas to begin with, but if it could be, uh, you know, how how difficult it would be to switch it over to electric in the future if that became the more economical. Well, electric, electric would involve um, most likely the same distribution of the actual pathway. Um, the challenge here is that, uh, you know, for the actual distribution. So, for instance, when the boiler heats, in this instance, the water, um, we could go with some type of a uh, continue that water distribution. But in regards to the utilization of the current technologies for heat pumps. Traditionally, that refrigeration occurs with, uh, with a different element, with glycol. And that glycol is, uh, has a greater propensity to uh, store heat and be distributed uh, in a greater concentration of BTUs than water does. So um, it's not really one of those things that could be augmented, but um, new technologies come up upon us all the time. So I'm sure in uh, 20 or 30 years, when we're looking down the road at a future renovation of the facility with an anticipated lifespan of at least 50 years, we'll be able to make intelligent decisions at that time for those people that are involved. Yeah, so just, just to clarify, so potentially we could use, you know, either a hot water or a, um, a refrigerated glycol system could use both those uh, those alternative uh, fuels, the electric or the natural gas. Yes. I appreciate that, thanks. Uh, Mark? Uh, yeah, uh, 
Whitney, you had mentioned um, it could potentially be uh, propane as the second su uh, fuel source for the mm. heating system. Mm -hmm. And if so, <clears throat> does it make sense to, to use that for the generator just to cut down on the number of tanks we may have on the premises? Or, you know, I don't know if propane's uh, better for, you know, generating emergency electric power on, on site or if it's better to stick with diesel, uh, you know, in that regard? Well, it's a good question, Mark. Um, so propane tends to run a little bit cleaner and therefore has, uh, you know, greater efficiency in that regards in relationship to the primary heating of the facility. As far as the electrical generation, um, you do have uh, numerous supply uh, opportunities for uh, fuel and propane is one of those. The uh, natural gas is another, diesel is another. The tanks themselves for the electrical generators tend to be self-contained and actually below the actual generator oh, okay. uh, in their engineering design. So the footprint remains the same. Uh, propane, you can bury the tank, so it really doesn't even require a footprint which right. is very, very economical. The, the challenge with the electrical generator and alternate fuels, are you susceptible to the delivery of those fuels during times of an emergency? So with either propane or uh, diesel fuels, diesel. there are, yeah, there are challenges in that regard, um, but that's handled very commonly in the uh, commercial distribution networks throughout, sure. our, throughout our region. So uh, I, I think it would, it would have probably, be perhaps a little bit um, easier for design purposes uh, and also for containment. I, I feel better about gas than I do about a stored liquid. Um, there always is the potential for breaching, even though there's tremendous amount of redundancy in regards to the vessels that hold the oil, um, that you know perhaps we could look uh, a little more closely at having a natural gas uh, generator generator or pardon me a propane generator that at that time would uh would also utilize the opportunity there for the the yeah. um you know but but what's going to happen here though is that so the differentiation for the natural gas delivery is what we understand to be two different things one is the connected demand the connected demand is not subject to interruption so we currently utilize uh, natural gas in the kitchen and for domestic water heating at the, the current facility, the current PEC school. My understanding is part of the interruptible service is that basic, you know, million BTUs would not be interruptible. Just the augmented requirement for the uh, Heating? The actual the actual heating yeah. uh, opportunity, so we can we can make sure to shake that down in the course of it. And uh, Marty Vicky, um, who's our primary engineer in relationship to this, as well as the electrical engineer through Frank and Chris, can uh, can lead us and guide us in the best alternatives there. But again, that's not anything that we have to decide tonight. Yeah, and just in regards to to the solar aspect, are, are we thinking of going? Um, of having like a little separate bid package to see what that might be at this point in time. Uh, it's yeah. yeah, I have a recommendation that, uh, you know, the, the actual component that we're attempting to achieve here or the, the utilization in the industry standard, the gold standard today, if you will, for uh, facilities of the size of which here is a concept called net zero. And net zero is when you produce enough electricity on site in order to substantiate 100% of your need. And so we, in, and Frank set us straight uh, two or three months ago in relationship to what he believes for the, um, the, the generated uh, load to be equivalent for photovoltaics with the current uh, efficiencies of the solar panels to be somewhere about two or three acres. We do not have two or three acres. The footprint of the building is only about 50,000 square feet or less. And that's uh, an acre is about 40 some odd thousand square feet. So at best we could get to a third of that. So um, we'll never achieve the net zero uh, level of efficiency, but the various opportunities for us now, if, if I can not wander in my thought and just 
present to you the best alternative that I've learned after a conversation with John Zwerko, who is the head engineer for these opportunities, is that it's not to rent out our roof to a third party. You get about 10 or 15 grand a year from that. It's right. not to, and then from there, what we could do is, you mentioned about the bid package. I recommend to be integrated into the savings of which we'll be able to obtain, which would bring us to the actual cost of which we had originally um, would have been presented with for the model school program, not the inflated costs of the variable uh, refrigerant flow alternative, which was the heat pumps. And so with that in mind and with tonight's vote, there will be some, some savings in my interpretation from what has been presented to the council that could be uh, utilized for purchase of the actual photovoltaic equipment, uh, the necessary inverters in order to convert it to line voltage usable within the building. And then um, even that is not sufficient because what you do then, if you generate electricity on site, and dump it back into a reverse feed meter or put it onto the grid, you're only obtaining a fraction of the worth of that. And then the utility, even though they are part of the city entity, sells it back to you. So you're not really obtaining a, a great efficiency from that whole process. But what, we, what I would recommend is what has become a standard of the industry. And as witnessed through the Holyoke Gas and Electric and their photovoltaic generation in various fields throughout the uh, the city, they are storing energy on those various locations using lithium batteries, such as Tesla equipment and, and, and other industry standard equipment, which is reaching a level of maturity now, which actually gives it a good longevity. And if you store the electricity on site, then you will utilize 100% of the electricity that you generated with the full value of the replacement cost of electricity. So it's, uh, it, I recommend we integrate it into the cost of the project. We utilize the savings from the, uh, from the uh, natural gas that that would offer us. And especially with the lack of design alterations from the base model. And then uh, immediately working through the gas and electric, um, they will be able to uh, provide us with some design opportunities to engineer this process of which they have shown specific interest in conversations that I've had with being able to utilize that stored energy from time to time. Uh, they can save upwards of $300,000 per hour by turning on their batteries from time to time in the summer. It's a huge value. So even a small amount that we would have would still be a value that we could make available to them and they would have a very particular interest in seeing our project come to fruition so that's that's it there okay thank you can we pause for a minute camellia is having trouble with interpretation i keep on setting it up so i just need to set it up and like talk to the interpreters for a minute i want her to be able to have access so sure okay it's a pretty complicated endeavor to try to interpret. I appreciate it. <laughs> yeah. Um, but Frank, does that does that ring true as far as what nope, your understanding? Nope. We're not going to talk while I set up the interpretation because Camelia can't access it. So I've added these interpreters. Are is it working? This is my fourth time adding them. So Okay, could an interpreter repeat what I'm saying and see if Camelia can hear it? And then Camelia, can you either come off or or type me so I know if it's working? It's still not working. Um, I'm going to go into screen share quick to see if anyone can help from what I'm seeing, but. Um, like this is what it's set up. I have interpreter one from English to Spanish, interpreter two, English to Spanish, and I've selected add interpreter. I can close these. Oh, maybe closing that will do it. Okay. <coughs> Let's see, could someone interpret what I'm saying and then we'll see if she can hear. Still nothing she's saying. Mm -hmm. Let me try one more time. 
add interpreter, Jennifer. English to Spanish. Okay. Could someone interpret what I'm saying to see if it's working? It's okay. Yay. Thank you. Well, well, thank you so much for your efforts, Erin. It's so much appreciated that we have these meetings available to everybody. So I greatly appreciate that. Um, okay. Sorry, Mr. Anderson, what were you just, you were asking Frank, if you've covered the nuts and bolts of that conversation, Frank, did you have anything to add? No, I think, uh, Whitney did a great job of explaining the, the systems that were available and why they were selected. So that was very well done. All right. Great. What think, so what do you think about the solar Frank? Well, you, there's always opportunities to find places to put them, but like you said, you need large acreage to get enough generation to make it a net zero building. Yeah. But we can always look for opportunities in the dingle at a later date. Thank you. All right, so I guess we could entertain a motion um, that we agree to adapt the plan to encompass the updated potentials with the oil, gas, and electric. And of course, Frank and Whitney and those involved will keep us updated as the project progresses um, with further updates and changes um, until the, the actual system is finalized, which at this time it's currently not. Um, so yeah, I think that sounds good. We entertain a motion to adapt the the plan to adopt the how exactly do you do you want this worded any specific way, Margaret? Uh Whitney, do you want to make a motion? I mean, I I think the motion is to um direct the architects to design the building to work with the uh holy gas and electrics. What do they call this? Interruptible gas service schedule. Okay. Interruptible gas service schedule. Does that sound correct? Perfect. Yeah, that sounds good. Okay. So Whitney's making that motion because I can't. Second. <laughs> Sorry, Mark, you seconded? Sure. <clears throat> All right, so on the motion that the committee accepts and approves the architects moving forward to plan the systems with oil, gas, and electric, any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor, please raise your digital or physical hand and keep them up for a moment for the note takers to take notes. Excuse my dogs. Okay. Um, I don't, oh, wait, Dave just came up. Okay, I think we're good. All right, any opposed? Please say aye, so then we can know to look for your hand. All right. And, uh, you know, of course, as we go forward with updates, we'll be looking for, you know, cost saving analysis as well. Um, but, you know, of course, the, the exact system's not finalized yet. So we'll look forward to that as we move forward. Um, I need to sign off from my computer and on from my phone because my computer is about to die and I can't find my charger. Uh, so excuse me as Margaret takes us into a review of the schedule. I will be right back. Okay, so, you know, um, we had, thank you very much to everybody who came or signed into the finance committee meeting last week. Um, it was a really good discussion. Um, and since most of you saw it, I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about it. Um, it, what it meant was the, the, I think five committee members unanimously, uh, recommended sending it to city council. So now that hearing is on June 6th, correct, Erin Linville? Yeah. So that's our big moment. Um, I really wanted to ask um, if anybody had any questions about that because the, the schedule milestones here are um, June 6th, they meet. They could vote on that night, hopefully they will. Um, it could be the 
following the backup plan, I think, was June 20th, right? Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Backup is June 20th. And then the MSBA board meeting is on the 21st, June 21st, I believe. So um, at that point, if city council votes to uh, support the, the bonding for the project, we have a fully funded project and it is all systems go. So um, in anticipation of that, I just wanna make sure that everybody's got in their calendars, our next committee meeting, which is Thursday, June 15th. And I also just wanna say, I know that this is a crazy time of year and I really appreciate um, everybody's coming and joining meetings in the end of May and June can be really tough. So, but um, what I am very much hoping is that at, the, at that meeting on the 15th, we're gonna lay out the schedule in detail for the rest of the project. And that's gonna involve um, determining whether um, it's possible for this committee to meet a couple times in the summer because the action is gonna be kind of fast and furious. Remembering that we are hoping to be putting the demolition of the project out to bid in July. So um, it, it's, it's gonna be fast. There's gonna be a lot of stuff to look at. So there's not a lot to look at tonight because although I think Member and Group has been advancing the project, um, they really don't have, they're not funded. Their fees are not funded yet um, to do that work in depth. So um, we're really kind of sticking to a high level uh, schedule there. I think we will continue to meet on Thursday since that's proved to be the best day. And I know it's going to get a little more challenging as we move into the summer months, but thank you all for sticking with us. So um, does anybody, let me pause there and ask if anybody has any comments or questions about the finance committee, the upcoming city council meeting, anything else that this group should talk about? Yeah, I'll just add that, um, you know, we encourage as many people to come to the June 6th meeting as possible. Um, if you're a Hoyoke resident, please, by all means, reach out to city council ahead of time. Um, you know, show your support, encourage your neighbors or your family members who support the project um, <clears throat> to bring their thoughts forward. You know, it came out of finance unanimously, so I feel pretty confident that We've answered all their questions. I feel like the the finance committee members will do a great job um, reinforcing our work at the full council meeting. So I truly believe that they're going to vote that night. So I think this is going to be it. And I look forward to, you know, potentially celebrating this with you all um, in city council chambers in person if possible. Does anybody else have anything they want to add? I see Dave, I see Mark. Yeah, I can't and Anya. see hands, sorry. So I'll let you call hands. So Anya, you've had your hand up for a little bit. Is that a holdover or? Sorry, that was just the boat, sorry. Okay, all right. So <laughs> I think that- I'm not used to the digital hand raising, sorry. Yeah, I think Dave uh, was next and then Mark Lubold. So Dave, what's up? Yeah, I think I'm- uh... I think I'm unmuted now. My, I, like Aaron, my my computer went down, so I had to switch to my phone. But I think I'm back on here, and I would say yes, it definitely, uh, definitely a vote of confidence from the uh, the finance committee unanimously. And uh, you know, I think I'm I'm pretty confident the, uh, you know, the full council will will uh, will go along with that uh, with that recommendation and. Uh, you know, as I said, it's a vote of confidence in us, you know, to keep the project on track to, uh, you know, to keep the, uh, keep the project economical, uh, you know, most efficient project. So, uh, so I hope we will go forward continuing with, with that. And Mark. Um, yeah, I just wanted to say, I, I, I can't be here on the 15th, but uh, you may want to find out who can be to make sure we have a quorum for these meetings going forward. Like you said, sometimes these summer uh, months get a little it, uh, hectic it, and crazy and I <laughs> am away, but, and I can't even get on to, to make that, uh, to make that meeting. Yeah. I, I think what we may do is, is send out um, 
a kind of survey to see which Thursdays we can get the most people and then kind of schedule the presentations around that. But um, yeah, it's, it's, we know it will be a challenge. And I, you know, I really, I just want to thank you all for sticking with it. It will, it's, it's moving quite quickly. So, um, okay. I don't see any other hands now. Going once, going twice. Okay. So, um, in the, so while all of that's been happening in the city, um, the team has been doing their work with the MSBA. So we had a couple of big milestones with the MSBA just to report on them briefly. So we had a meeting a couple of weeks ago with what is called the Facilities Assessment Subcommittee, which is a, a subset of the board who provide peer review comments. Um, it also folds in the ability for DESE, Department of Elementary and Secondary Education to provide comments. So they had a few comments, we responded. Um, then we had what's called the project, project scope and budget meeting. These are, these are all steps along the way to the board meeting. The project scope and budget meeting is where they come back and say, we've looked at the total project budget. That's that complex spreadsheet that I drafted and reviewed with you. We've looked at that. We have a couple of comments actually their comments were very, very minimal. Um, as recently as the end of the day Friday, they had one more question. But at this point, that is all done, which means that the staff is now, quote unquote, writing the board memo. So that means we've passed through all the, the multiple needles that uh, threaded the needles with the MSBA. And so we're on uh, track to uh, the board meeting vote on the 21st. So um, the, at this point, there's no world in which the board will not support this. The point of the MSBA staff review is to basically make a recommendation to the board to vote for it. So that's also a really great step in the process. Um, did anybody who participated in any of those meetings wanna add anything? It was basically Anthony, Aaron, I think Josh was at one of the meetings, um, Mount Vernon group, of course. Nope, <laughs> not seeing any hands. Okay. Oh, I think you covered it. All right. So um, the last thing that was on the agenda uh, for tonight was um, per, just to let you all know that we have had, um, some interesting comments made, uh, public comments made uh, during the public meeting. So if you listened to the meeting, the finance committee meeting last week, you may have heard um, a bit of this back and forth. Um, there is a, a process um, that, uh, you know, I think it's, it's complicated to understand, but in a nutshell, the, um, Environmental, the Energy and Environmental Affairs Department of the state who manage what's called the Massachusetts Environmental Protection Agency, MEPA, is the, is, they, um, they have a, a process through which projects have to kind of self-assess themselves and decide if they're meeting any of the thresholds that would require further environmental review. So um, we have a civil engineer who's part of the Mount Vernon group team and they did the assessment and we didn't meet any of those thresholds, therefore no filing is required. Um, there is a member of the public um, who doesn't agree with that, thinks that we do have to <laughs> file something and we're at a bit of a stalemate on that, um, the uh, MEPA won't weigh in on this. Um, they, um, the process is fairly standard. Um, and I will tell you that I don't consider that we have done anything other than check, do exactly what the process requires. So um, I think, I, I wish that we could get to uh, a sort of better place with the gentleman who's raising the concerns, but um, I know he has been reaching out to MEPA and they haven't been returning his calls. So that's probably not a good sign either. <laughs> so, 
Um, just so you know, if anybody is interested in, and actually maybe I will just circulate the memo that was um, provided by Brandon Consultant that summarizes this. But I mean, in a nutshell, I think the gentleman doesn't believe that applicants, developers, you know, in this case, the city is a developer, right? They're redeveloping a site. Developers are allowed to do their own assessment of um, environmental requirements. But in fact, that's why we have professionals on the team because they do do that and their liability is sort of embedded in their recommendation. So, so does anybody have any questions about that complicated topic? <laughs> I mean, would it help if like a consultant reviewer stepped in and just basically, you know, attested to, yeah, this is the typical process and based on all, all of, you know, a site visit and all the um, available GIS data that there isn't likely to be habitat or a take of any species. I mean, I, I work with an office of people who could, could do that. <laughs> it's, well, it's pretty, you know. I don't know. I wouldn't I, want to see us spin too much yarn. You know, I don't that. know that anything we can do will appease this guy other than submitting, asking for the submittal, but mm -hmm. it's not, it's simply not required. Um, he's a professor of landscape architect and, you know, very into, so I just, you know, the, the city council basically voted to accept his comments. Um, they all agreed that we've done our due diligence and, you know, the MSBA and said forces wouldn't, you know, let us get this far without ensuring we're doing the process right. Um, so the council doesn't seem too concerned. So I don't know that any further action is needed um, unless anybody disagrees with me, but that was kind of the city council seemed satisfied with, you know, the, the steps we've taken based on what the law requires. Um, you know, Anya, since you're offering, I, I am going to share the Brennan memo with the entire committee. And I suspect that the mayor, uh, since he, you know, nominated you along with others to be on, on the committee, and since the company that you work for works in this realm, would be grateful for uh, another set of eyes on it. Um, I, I, I agree. I agree with Aaron Brunel. I think what's, what's, what was awkward about the conversation was that a couple of the city councilors were like, well, can't you get MEPA to opine yeah. on this? And no. yeah, thank you for that, <laughs> that, that shake of the head. No, you can't yeah. get MEPA to open. No, MEPA will not speak on this. Right. So um, that, that's the kind of, that's the awkwardness. I, I want the city council and everybody associated with this project to feel comfortable about this. So he's introduced an element of uncertainty for those who don't operate in this realm. Anyone who operates in this realm would look at this memo and go, yes, there is no issue here. So, but I wanted you all to be aware of this. Dave, you had a question? Well, just, just my comment, I'm just wondering why there would be need to be permitting if there's already a, you know, building on the site. So we're not, uh, we're not opening up anything new. It's the same, uh, same site where it already is. So, well, you know, I, I would encourage you to read the memo. There's, there's 12 thresholds and they range from, is there endangered species habitat to, are you disturbing less than X square feet of area? And it's, there's kind of everything in between. I mean, the process is a really good process because it identifies 12 potential causes of environmental degradation and, and it requires you to say where you are relative to the threshold. But there has to be a threshold because otherwise even the smallest project, the, the intention is to allow MEPA the Environmental Protection, Mass Environmental Protection Agency to focus on the projects where there is a real risk of, de of environmental degradation, therefore the threshold, and we are below the threshold. So it doesn't, it's not about whether there, there's a building on the site, it's about how big your site is, what are the qualities of the site, all these different 
pieces that make up environmental degradation? Are, is, is there a water body nearby? Um, so I, does, does that help? So, so this has to be submitted and then it will just turn no, out to be. No, oh nothing, nothing needs to be submitted because we are, are underneath the thresholds that require submission. And the gentleman's point is, no, 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 you have to submit no matter what. That's not the way it works. If you're under the threshold, you don't submit. There's no further review. It would basically stall things, carry, like just drag it out, cost the city a ton of money to hire a consultant to put together an ENF and just to find that there is no take, there is no need to do this. And the regulators would likely be ticked off that they even had to look at it because <laughs> we don't meet the threshold <laughs> criteria. Yeah. They have to look at so many of these and it's like a six, you know, it's a it's a year long plus process. It, it's, it really takes forever. So Dave, your hand is still up. So is that because your question is not answered or is that? So I, I just, you know, hopefully there's a way we can avoid all this, uh, this extra unnecessary work. So we don't need to do anything. We don't. No, there's no, there's no requirement. Done. There. No, there is, we there do really not meet the threshold. This gentleman is saying we have to do something we are not required to do. We are not clear. going to do anything beyond what we have done. All right. Well, that sounds good then. So. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> All righty. Um, that was the agenda. Do Does anyone All right, so on the committee have anything else they want to talk about? I was just going to say, I don't think any um, subcommittees have met. Um, if any chairs have and would like to discuss, feel free to interrupt me. Uh, communication working group is, is meeting tomorrow. Again, just to kind of do that final push to encourage people to uh, get out to the full council meeting that's uh, next week. So super excited about that. Uh, Mr. Yost, I see you. Did your committee meet? Uh, no, I didn't. I'm trying to trying to get my hand down. But, uh, okay, no worries. Mess, so. <laughs> no worries, Mr. Yost. I wanted to make sure you got your chance to update us if necessary. So, um, all right. Well, barring nothing further, um, I don't see anybody with anything. Going once, going twice. I will entertain a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Thank you, Mr. Lubold. Can I have a second? Second. Thank you, Anthony Soto. All right, all those in favor? Oh, sorry, any further discussion? No? All right, all those in favor? Digital or virtual hand? Digital, virtual, right. physical, all of the above. <laughs> we need to approve minutes from the last meeting. I'm sure it's unanimous, but oh, hi, Mr. Tallman. Welcome back. Made it back on. Yeah. Um, there she is. Uh, any opposed? Chime in with an I, but I'm sure there's not. All right. Well, thank you, everybody. Hopefully, we'll see you at council next week. If not, we'll uh, certainly be updating you via email, um, MSBA, on the 21st, and we'll see you at our next meeting. Um, and then please look for some emails so that we can discuss our meeting schedule coming up. So thanks, guys. Have a great evening. Jessica, we did approve the minutes at the beginning before you joined, OK? Um, I, I'll go along. Uh, thank you. I, I was having trouble remaining logged in, so I apologize for that. I no just worries. Make sure. No, thank we you. had a quorum. Thank you for checking. Take care, Margaret. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye. Good at all.